grace and peace be multiplied um, to you all in the precious and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We are continuing in the Saturday School series dealing with the miracles of Jesus Christ. And this is episode five of 16 within that series. And today we will cover Jesus' miracle by which a coin appears in a fish's mouth and is used to pay the temple tax that the tax collectors had inquired Peter about concerning whether Jesus would pay tribute or not. This is Refuge Temple NC Bible Institute. We are a ministry of Refuge Temple Church located in the heart of Burlington, North Carolina. We pray that this video is a blessing to you and that it provides you with some educational thought as well as um, giving you some insight into what the Word of God says pertaining to the miracles of Jesus. As is customary, we will go over a description of the series and then outline the lesson plan for today. And then we will progress from there. As shown on the slide, this is a description of what this series will cover in the season description. The topic which we are studying is the miracles of Jesus. As we know, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, record roughly 40 miracles that Jesus performed while he was here on the earth. And we will cover 15 of those 40 in this series. Each episode um, will provide a comprehensive lesson about each miracle. If you want to receive updates and notifications when these videos are posted, follow Refuge Temple NC Bible Institute on Facebook and set your favorites to receive notifications of the video posts. As published every week at the beginning of the video, you will see uh, an agenda of the episodes. We are in episode five as shown highlighted in the orange text. Our subject for this week is dealing with the coin in the fish's mouth. In the introduction to this series, we outlined a few different categories in which we would study these miracles. The first of which are titled the miracles of provision. The miracle that we are going to talk about today falls under this category. The text is found in Matthew chapter 17, verse number 24 through 27. Is our lesson plan. This week's lesson covers the fourth miracle in our extensive list. This miracle was almost solely done to bring light to Jesus' status as king. It is also a testament to how God handles challenges to his sovereignty much different than we do. The lesson plan is as follows. We will start by looking at what the text says in Matthew chapter 17 verse 24 through 27. We will then provide some background um, to the biblical account. We will go into some explanation of the text and draw some points out of it. And we will tie the miracle to the greater revelation in which the miracle provides. Then we will wrap up and preview next week's lesson in that Here's the text. The account where the fish presents tribute money 
at the commandment of Jesus. It is found in the text that I already have referenced in Matthew chapter number 17, verse 24 through verse 27. Now we will read the text and then go from there. The word of the Lord is found in Matthew chapter 17. We are going to first read from the King James Version and then compare it to the Living New Living Translation. The King James Version reads as recorded. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take, and give them to me, for me and thee. The New Living Translation speaks on this wise, starting at verse number 24. It says, on their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, does not your teacher pay the tribute tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. Then he went into the house. But before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? They tax the people they have conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them. So go down to take and throw in a line. Open the mouth of the first fish you catch and you find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. And that is the word of the Lord recorded for this week's lesson. And before we study the details of the text, we will need to take a look at some significant facts that help provide context into the situation and the miracle that the scriptural account gives. And we will look at some historical background of Israel to establish facts about the coin. Then we will deal with the tribute itself in the exposition of the text. The former nation of Israel um, was split into two nations in 930 BC after the death of Solomon. They were split into two nations um, the first was Israel, which consisted of 10 tribes. Historically, they are referred to as the Northern Kingdom. Two tribes in the South um, became to be known as Judah. They are historically known as the Southern Kingdom, which include Judah and Benjamin. Each nation sank into cycles of apostasy over the next 300 years. God judged each nation and allowed the com commanding foreign nations to conquer them. Israel, um, they were conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BC and Judah thereafter in 587 BC by the Babylonians. Each of these instances is known as the exiles or the captivities. In each case, the normal citizens of Israel or Judah, they fled to surrounding nations or they remained in the land after the conquest. However, the prominent citizens of the nation were carried out to 
um, the empires, um, mostly to keep them from rebelling against um, their conquerors. Not much is recorded in the Bible about the outcome of the northern kingdom. We know they were conquered by the Assyrians. Some of them were taken away, and that is all that we know. However, the biblical record continues concerning the outcome of the southern kingdom. After they were conquered by Babylon, um, much was written about it through the prophet Jeremiah and other prophets who God called into that time of period as the captives were in Babylon. However, um, the Babylonians were conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire in 539 BC, Um, the captives of Judah became the citizens of this empire by default. However, after 70 years in captivity, which was prophesied by Jeremiah the prophet, the Judean captives were permitted to go back to their homeland. And over a long period of time, well into 100 years, um, they would make expeditions back to the homeland to rebuild the temple, to reestablish the land, and finally to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the temple was rebuilt in 722, excuse me, 522 BC. Um, And the walls in Jerusalem were rebuilt sometime after then. Uh, Many sources think this was around 444 BC. However, the date is disputed. This new nation, uh, which would only consist of Judah, Benjamin, and some remnants of the other tribes, um, would form this new nation of Israel. And they would only occupy a small section of the original land um, that at its height um, borders um, were expanded through David and Solomon. It was a much smaller land and a much smaller temple. Over the next 430 years after the reestablishment of Israel as a nation, um, they would have a sordid history, much of which was prophesied by Daniel There are no scriptures within our modern canon that covers any of this history. However, the prophecies of Daniel do speak about it prophetically. There is much written about the time, especially from secular sources outside of Israel concerning this these time periods, which we are discussing right now. Israel enjoyed peace, relative peace, for the first hundred years after the reestablishment of the settlement in Jerusalem. However, after then, a pivotal moment took place in history with the conquest of Alexander the Great, in which he took over a lot of the known world. As most know, Alexander did not live a long time, so what would happen to the region thereafter fell into the hands of his lineage. And over the next three centuries, um, this would shape Israel. This period is referred to as the Hellenistic period by scholars, both Christian and secular. Um, Israel would be absorbed by the Seleucid Empire, which was one of the four empires They came out of Alexander, and this was prophesied once again by Daniel. The Jews were very resistant to this change, to this Greek culture, and very slow to adapt to it, and some would argue that they never did. You will see to the right a map which shows the Seleucid Empire, which we see stretches from the Mediterranean well over to this area of the world. That is a substantial piece of geography there. During the Hellenistic period, 
the political structures, the buildings, the lingua franca, which was just a common language in which transactions was made, and the monetary system in the Seleucid Empire was Greek. So much of the world, including Israel, um, would fall into Greek culture. In 63 BC, however, um, the Roman Empire took control of the region and many other regions which were formerly occupied by the Greeks and those who served under them. Because of this, because of this situation, this historic situation, Judea was religiously Jewish, culturally Greek, and administratively Roman. So we had a mixture of influences in the culture in which Jesus arrived. The big question is, why do we need to know this? Why is this important? This is important because it gives us context into the culture in which this miracle took place. Why do we need to know all this? Since this miracle involves money, we need to know something about the monetary system at the time. And since this is a tribute, which was obviously not Roman, it was not a Roman tax, we need to know how it translates to the Jewish culture or the regional culture in which we are discussing. Today. Now that we have established that the Jewish people at the time of Jesus lived in a blended culture, of Jewish, Greek, and Roman influences, uh, we will look at the specific aspects of the miracle of this coin. All right, this record, this short account that Matthew gives us is placed in this chapter of un seemingly unrelated events. It looks as if Matthew just put together a list of things, events and sayings of Jesus without providing much in the way of context or relationship. Jesus and some of his disciples are in Capernaum, which was one of the established headquarters of Jesus ministry for some undisclosed reason. Evidently, Jesus was inside a house in which Peter was just outside of or at the door. Some undisclosed men approach Peter inquiring him about whether Jesus pays tribute. This word tribute in the New Testament language often refers to a tax or a duty. The King James does not disclose um, what this tax was or who it was collected by, but other English translations do, including the living, New Living Translation, which we read. Um, they refer to it as a temple tax. Um, this tribute is also referred to others, by others rather, as the double drachma tax. Jesus, or rather Peter, rashly answers their question and says, yes, he does. When Peter goes inside the house, Jesus prevents Peter from doing something. It doesn't exactly say what, but possibly from going to get money to pay the collectors. Jesus asked Peter a question concerning whether a king's children are required to pay taxes. Peter answers correctly, no, they are not to pay taxes. They're the king's children. But Jesus said in order not to offend them, um, to go out and to 
go to the sea, throw out a line, catch a fish. First fish you catch, open its mouth and retrieve the money to pay for myself and for you, Peter. That is all that Jesus said. Well, okay, Jesus told Peter to catch a fish and take a coin out of its mouth. The coin was enough to pay for them both. Why does this matter enough to be included in Matthew's gospel? And what can we learn from this miracle? First, it seems fitting that Matthew out of the four gospel writers would be the one to record this and to with special emphasis notice this miracle um, because Matthew himself was a tax collector. That was his career. To understand the history of this tribute, um, we must determine the nature of this temple tax. We have two questions related to this. First, what was the double drachma that the Jews were requiring to pay? And what was Jesus trying to show by his statement to Peter and by paying the tribute? Um, to do so, let's observe the Greek in the linear version of the text and pick this up from Bible Hub. Looking at the Greek interlinear version, which I picked up from BibleHub.com. We will read an excerpt found in Matthew, which you will see enclosed in the red box. And the word says in the Greek, Ho didaskalos hymen au telai ta didrachma which translates to be the teacher of you, not does he pay the didrama. This Greek word used is didramaka. What does this word mean? In the English, it just refers to a tribute or in the New Living Translation, the temple tax. But the Greek uses this word Let's find out what it means. From the Strong's Concordance, this word means a double drachma. It is used twice in scripture. It literally means two drachma. A drachma is a Greek silver coin. The drachma was a currency in ancient Greece um, thought by modern sources to be worth roughly one day's wage for a skilled worker, such as a carpenter or a plumber. Yes, they had plumbers back then. Praise the name of our God. So this was a substantial amount, but it was an affordable amount. It wasn't hard to pay. It might hurt you a little bit, but it was that's the relationship between the drachma and today's money. So in today's society, this would be roughly 100 to $150. Okay, we talked about currency. What does this currency have to do with the tribute? Well, it may help us to understand what this tax was and tie it to the miracle. Now that we have established the monetary value of the coin, it was two days wage, we have another question. What was this tribute, this temple tax that the men asked Peter about? There are two prevailing scriptural sources about this tax or what it may have been. They are Exodus chapter 30, verse 13 through verse 15, and Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 32. Let us read the word of the Lord. Nehemiah says, 
also we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of the Lord. Then Exodus chapter 30, verse 13 through 15. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 jerahs. A half a shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give the offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. And when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. You already see where I'm going with this. A half a shekel for Peter, half a shekel, Jesus, one shekel, double dachma. All right, more about the coin. Now we're going to go back to the Greek interlinear. And we're going to look further into the last part of the text, which we read. Um, we see where the mouth of the fish is open. And the Bible uses this word statera. Statera is a word that means an attic silver coin equal in value to the Jewish shekel. So the definition of, of a stater is a four drachma coin, which equals a shekel. So in the terms of Jewish society, we have a half a shekel each is the temple tax, is a half a shekel. Two drachma equals a half of a shekel. Four drachma equals one shekel. We also show this in the next slide. Now let us see why this miracle was so important. And to do that, let us return to the text in the King James Version, and I will read aloud again. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? of their own children or of strangers. Peter saith unto him of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. I want to direct us to verse number 25 again. And what Jesus says, he says, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. There is a lot of Jesus in this very small statement. So what can we draw out of this statement that the king's children are not required to pay tribute? Neither are the kings required to pay tribute. Well, let's look at these truths. 
Jesus is the king of Israel, thereby exempt from paying any tribute to the temple. Why? Because he is Lord of the temple. He is high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He is also Lord of creation, the almighty God who created all things by the word of his power. And for this reason, he is exempt from paying tribute to any government, including the Roman government. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If anything, the Romans should be paying tribute to Jesus. This is the third significant point or lesson we can draw. Neither do the children of the kingdom owe any tribute to either. This is not a matter of debt. We are not of this world and we are not indebted to this world as children of the kingdom of God because we belong to a kingdom that supersedes kingdom. But, 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 let's hold up a second before we get too ambitious. But Jesus showed Peter a great truth by showing him something, by showing him that righteousness goes beyond what is required. Peter was not required to pay the tax. Jesus was not required to pay the tax, but did so. Understand this, that Jesus as Lord and Christ could have exercised his authority as God of all and King of Israel. And he would not have had to pay that tax and there is no way they would have been able to make him do it. Everything that happened to Jesus Christ, it was through his forbearance. It was not through force. Force could not overcome him. Even in the likeness of sinful flesh, even in the likeness of frail humanity, the kings of this earth could not overthrow Jesus if he so chose for that to be. But he yielded. He submitted. Why did he submit? He submitted because righteousness goes beyond that which is required because there was a much greater lesson to be had specifically concerning Peter. Okay. He showed his forbearance by submitting to both. And if you don't think this is like God, think about the many centuries and the many millennia that he has put up with all of the nonsense, all the mess that we as human beings have created in this world and the things that we have done to each other and to this environment and tell me that God is not merciful. I think anybody would have a hard time saying that with a straight face. And for that reason, we cannot be greater than our master. It is not holy to exercise authority to prove one's righteousness. That's a whole nother lesson we could have, but we'll table that for now. Our righteousness has to be established based off of Jesus Christ's righteousness, and it has to stand on its own. And we cannot use our authority in that manner. And yes, we are to use our authority. Don't get me wrong, but not in this matter. All right. Jesus also showed that provision will always be made by God when we go to do that which is right. Let's bring it home and then close. This notable miracle hits home in two ways. First, it involves taxes, which mostly is not a good subject. Most of us don't like to think about taxes. Uh, it also involves providing for religious service. The temple tax was right. 
it was a mandate of the law. It was not something that the Jewish culture made up after the fact. This is one of the few things in which they didn't. Um, so it was right for the temple to require this of the citizens of Israel and all those who would be under the um, temple worship. Matthew would have placed special emphasis on this miracle because he was a tax collector and he was illustrating Jesus as the son of David. As we stated in the beginning, this is only found in Matthew. As in the case of last week's miracle, dealing with Jesus turning the water into the wine, um, there were limited people who knew about this miracle or who performed it. Um, this miracle seems to only show that God can provide by extraordinary means. But however, under closer examination, we see a much greater importance to this miracle. Some of the things we can learn from it is that righteousness goes beyond the requirements of human government and society. And it goes beyond even the requirements of the law. The believer has authority that is above kingdoms, above rulers of this world, but we are still required to submit and when doing so does not cause us to sin against God. Submission to earthly authorities, both church and state, is right in its proper place. And yes, we all know of instances where this has been abused. But the concept itself is right. God will always provide resources to do this if you fear that following the mandate of man or of God will require you to go broke or to be abused, he will always provide a means. Something to point out again, we don't know this, but it is possible that Peter was actually going to get the money to pay the tax collectors. But Jesus wanted to show um, that he has, I have you covered. And let's talk about this in the closing. We don't know where this gold piece came from. The gold piece could have been formed in the fish. The fish could have been commanded ahead of time to put the gold piece in its mouth and come to the shore waiting to be baited. We simply don't have those details. But it shows you that Jesus can make things happen by not only the word of his power, but just by simply thinking it it shall come to pass. This ought to excite us. This ought to inspire us um, to look for the more excellent way. Um, that when we are faced with decisions, and in this case, Peter already had answered the question. He says, I know Jesus. I know who he is. I've, I've known him for three and a half years. I know if nobody's going to pay the temple tax, he's going to pay it. But Jesus was trying to show him a much greater truth and that is yes I will pay the tax but I pay it because I want to show you that you need to be submissive and not because I have to do it and not because you have to do it but if we are to gain the world sometimes you have to submit to the higher powers the Apostle Paul had much to say about this topic, but that is not within the scope of this lesson, so we will digress. Right, this is the conclusion of this episode. Um, it was episode five. As stated in the introduction, we will discuss and break down one of the list of miracles each session or each lesson. Um, today we covered the fourth miracle on the list, the fish with the coin. Next week, we will explore the account of Jesus providing fish to the disciples on two separate occurrences. Um, one occurrence was post-resurrection. Prepare for a study by looking at those scriptures, which I did not put down. Thank you for watching this video. Please give us a shout out on Google, Facebook, or YouTube. Also, share the video if you like it. 
Um, you know, encourage people to subscribe to YouTube, encourage people to follow Facebook and Twitter. In our closing, this is again Saturday School. Please consider supporting us by providing a cash donation at Cash App at the Cash App sign listed. Or you can hit the donate tab on our website listed. You can also catch us on the Facebook page. Um, this is Saturday School. We post a biblical lesson every Saturday concerning some topic of importance. If you would like for us to cover a topic or answer a question, please submit it to the Facebook page, to our website, or to Google, or rather Twitter at the Twitter handle. You can also comment on Google as well, and we will get back with you. Godspeed, God blessings to everybody. Be encouraged to be a lifelong learner of the word of God. And our mission is to provide biblical instruction to everyday people. Shalom.